this morning, Acts chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the second two-thirds of the chapter this morning, Acts chapter 13. Before we read the passage this morning, I wanted to reiterate what Juan was mentioning earlier, that this Tuesday is called Reformation Day because on October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses. They were just 95 statements of concern about prevailing church doctrine and practice in his day on a church door, and obviously a number of events in his own heart and study had led up to that moment, as well as other preachers who were noticing errors in prevalent church teaching, and that led eventually to what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation, if you're, if you're not familiar, is probably most helpfully summarized around what are known as five solas, sola in the Latin word for only or alone, solely, we translate it alone, using the following five statements. Scripture alone, meaning that Scripture is the only and sole authority for the church, that everything else must be evaluated by the words of Scripture. That is obviously the foundation for the rest. Sola gratia, grace alone, meaning that the salvation of sinners is exclusively based on the unmerited grace of God, his favor towards those who deserve only punishment and based on nothing good in them either before or after their conversion. Sola fide, faith alone, meaning that the means of sinners receiving that grace is not their work or even their attendance to the practices of the church, but exclusively the instrument of faith, which is looking away from themselves and towards the grace of God. The Reformers would also say that faith is a gift of God. The faith is the gift, and so is the grace that flows through that gift to the undeserving sinner. Solus Christus, Christ alone, meaning the sole and exclusive purchaser and possessor of our salvation is the work and person of Jesus Christ. There is no other Savior, no other object of salvation than Jesus Christ. And finally, soli Deo Gloria, meaning to God alone be the glory, which means all of these things ultimately redound to God alone, that he alone receives the glory for the salvation of his people. And, and this week, we're celebrating 500 years of that heritage. It obviously wasn't um, an inno innovation or an invention of Martin Luther and the other reformers. It was merely them looking back at the scriptures and celebrating what was true in the scriptures, that those truths are the biblical gospel according to God. And I think this morning is a particularly providential morning for us to be celebrating this because we have before us a message and the response to that message, but essentially a message of the Apostle Paul, of all the weeks for us to land on this sermon. This is a sermon that Paul gave. It's one of a couple of sermons. Luke can't obviously give all of the sermons that were given in the early church, but he does give some samples. He gives sermons of, of Peter as an example. He gives a sermon of Stephen as an example. He gives sermons of Paul, a couple of them as an example. And here's an example of Paul preaching the gospel. And I think we'll see as we, as we look through Paul's message that it really contains all of these solas of the Reformation. I, I think Martin Luther, the other reformers, would be thrilled to look at this passage with us. I, we can't look at it in great detail because of the length this morning, and we, we don't, I don't think it's going to be helpful for us to be in Acts until I'm 95 years old. Um, so we are moving a little bit through Acts, but it is a rich and marvelous sermon. If you want to know what Paul preached like, look at the second half of Acts chapter 13 and imagine him standing in front of the synagogue of Jews and preaching and proclaiming, and listen for this. Do these truths resonate in your own heart? Yes. 
Do they resonate in your own soul? Can you hear your own heart saying, Amen, as Paul preaches it? I pray that will be the experience as we read it this morning. So let's read this account of Paul speaking in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 13 with his travel. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance up to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him or understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, and be astounded, and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 
And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless the preaching of his word. The central question is always, always, whether we are rejoicing in or rejecting the gospel. The central question for every life, for every moment, for every generation, is whether we are rejoicing in or rejecting the gospel message. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul, preaching the gospel message I'm just going to break down this passage. I'm sure you could have done the exact same thing into two sections. The message and the response. The message and the response. And the question for us is, are we rejoicing in or rejecting that message in our hearts and as a church and as a generation? Rejoicing in or rejecting. It's the same message. It hasn't changed for 2,000 years since Paul preached it. It's the same message proclaimed by the Reformers 500 years ago. The message of Jesus Christ and his salvation. Grace and grace alone. Faith and faith alone to the glory of God alone. Rejecting or rejoicing. Look back there just for the background of this message. You notice that Paul is sailing from Paphos. That's where he en encountered uh, the false magician Elimus in the previous passage. He sails. He's sailing on the Mediterranean, basically going from place to place to preach the gospel with Barnabas. He sails into uh, to the north, basically, and he makes his way uh, up. We, there's some presumption that Paul might have been ill at this point based on other things he says and the low-lying area of the region. So he goes up in elevation elevation, and he finally finds his way to a different Antioch, Antioch in Pisidia. Remember, he left from Antioch, uh, but then he went across the Mediterranean. He's going up now to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, which is Paul's custom, he goes into the synagogue, the synagogue of Jewish people and those who are converting, perhaps, uh, to Judaism. And he sits down. He listens to a reading from the Law and the Prophets, and it would typically be the case that after the reading, there would be some sort of exhortation. Well, the leaders invite Paul and Barnabas, perhaps <laughs> not knowing the full extent of the result of this invitation. Um, <laughs> you should never invite somebody to speak till you're sure what they're going to say. It's really unwise. Um, so <laughs> they invite Paul and Barnabas to come and give a word of exhortation. So Paul stands in the fashion of the day. He's motioning with his hand and he begins to preach. That leads into his message. Now, this message is basically broken into three sections like all good messages, <laughs> should be. You think seminaries made that up, but they got it from Paul. It's broken into three sections. First of all, the history of salvation. You notice that. Then the culmination of that salvation in Jesus Christ, and then the call to a response. So look at this message. You notice Paul begins by tracing, look there in verse 16, the history of God's salvation. I, I can't get into detail on all these points, but I want to make one overarching point. This history of salvation accents and emphasizes the sorrow sovereign grace of God towards his people. You can notice that just by looking at the verbs. Look at the verbs that I think are very intentionally chosen throughout this passage. It says in verse 17, the God of this people, of people Israel, chose our fathers. So God chose them. Then it says in 17, he made the people great. That means he increased uh, their size and influence during their stay in the land of Egypt. Then with uplifted arm at the end of 17, he, he led them out of it. Then in verse 18, for about 40 years, what a, what a phrase. He put up with them. Another, you could translate that, he carried them, perhaps. Another manuscript says he carried, he put up with them in the wilderness. 
Then in verse 19, after destroying, that's God doing that, seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet and the people asked for a king. You might want to notice that the one thing that they initiate of consequence turns into a disaster uh, named Saul. But God gave them Saul. You can read about that uh, in the book of Samuel. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. But after then, he removes Saul. Notice action word again. He raises up David to be their king, the man who would actually be after God's own heart. And then the culmination, you can see the transition happening in verse 23. He brought to Israel a savior from David's own offspring. Just one point I want to make about this history of salvation that is essentially Paul's lengthy intro to get to what he wants to talk about, which is Jesus. God did it all. Paul is unequivocal. God did it all. He chose them. He saved them. He rescued them. He bore with them. He raised up the right king, took away the bad king. God did it all. All of the history of salvation is a story of God's unmerited and unaided initiative towards the people of God. God did it all. That's what Paul says. If you want to know the foundation, let's look back, brothers, he says to his fellow Jews. Look back at the history of salvation. You'll notice this. Anything the good that happened, God started it. God did it all. And that then leads him, what an intro. It leads him into the culminating act of God. The culminating action of God, the pinnacle of a history of actions of salvation, he says, and God has done one final majestic and ultimate thing. One ultimate thing. That all of the previous acts of salvation, it led up to it, and here's the ultimate thing, God says in verse 23. Here's the culmination of this man's offspring. God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, just as he promised. Very important. Paul jumps from David to Jesus because every faithful Jew was anticipating that one day a son of David, because God promised David in 2 Samuel 7, he promised David a son that would sit on his throne forever and rule over the nations and would protect and preserve the people of Israel. He would be a man that would be called God's son. So that anticipation of a a greater David to come was there in the people. And Paul is saying, God has done what he promised. From the offspring of David, his inheritance is fulfilled in this one, Jesus Christ. So he jumps from David to Jesus intentionally because of the messianic expectation based on David and the promises God had given to him. Then he references, as he's talking about Jesus, he references the great prophet John the Baptist. And he says John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance. But even as great a prophet as John was, John declared that he was not the coming Messiah, but rather one so much greater than him that he was unworthy even to untie his sandals. So in this culmination of Christ part of his message, he's basically going to begin laying out the groundwork for defending why it is the case that Jesus actually is God's chosen Messiah. So he says, first of all, I bring you John the Baptist. He declared that one was coming greater than he was. Then he says in verse 26, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham. You'd want to remember the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all of the earth would be blessed. Those living in Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus. So Paul is now going to begin a two-part fulfillment section of his message. He's going to say, look, here's what happened. Jesus fulfilled the scriptures by dying and rising again. We, We know he's the Messiah because he fulfilled the scriptures by dying and rising again. He says, ironically, the people in Jerusalem didn't see what was before their very eyes in the scriptures, and they fulfilled those scriptures by hanging Jesus on a tree. I've mentioned this before. It's very important. Whenever the word tree is used for cross, it's referencing the Old Testament text, which says that anyone who hangs on a tree is under God's curse. That's why they don't use the word cross. They're making a theological point. They're saying, look, this man was under God's curse to fulfill the scriptures. 
He's saying the scriptures predicted that a Messiah would suffer. He's probably thinking of Isaiah 53, where the lamb is led to the slaughter, suffers for the sins of others, dies for sins, not his own. He's saying those scriptures unwittingly were fulfilled by the very Jews who read them. And we know that this was not an accident or some random act in history because, because though he was guiltless and placed under God's curse, when all that had been written of him, verse 29, was carried out, then God raised him from the dead. And he raised him, 31, in front of many witnesses. And we bring you the good news. That all that God promised, verse 33, he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. And then he begins to quote the scriptures. You'll notice in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about Paul's sermon to pagans in Corinth who are used to worshiping idols. His message is very different to them. It's the same core message, believe in Jesus, but it starts at a different place. Here he's talking to Jews who know the scriptures and he's trying to show them, look, God was faithful to fulfill in Jesus all that he promised to you. God was faithful to bring about everything that he promised. Jesus' life fulfilled the very scriptures you read. So he references in the second psalm, Psalm 2, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Reference to a divine king called God's son who will rule over the nations, who is the only hope of refuge for mankind. He's saying there had to be a Messiah who could escape death to be this kind of eternal ruling son. And how do we know that this Jesus is the Messiah. Well, he's fulfilled the promises made to David. Promises were to David that there would be a son who would rule eternally on his throne and he would not face corruption. And so he quotes Psalm 16 in verse 35 and says, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Here's what Paul's doing. He's doing biblical theology. He's looking back at their Old Testament scriptures and he's saying, look, look at this. Let's just look at a few scriptures, brothers. You know Psalm 2. You know there's going to be a great son and he's going to rule over the nations with a rod of iron and he's going to be the place of refuge for anyone who will come to him in faith. You, you know there's going to be that person, right? We know that's the case. That person had to be the fulfillment of the promise to David that there would be this eternal ruling king. It's the same person. Brothers, you know that, right? You know 2 Samuel 7. You know the great covenant. You know what God said to David. Well, if, if that's the case, it must be the one, the Holy One of God, the Anointed One, the Messiah of God. That's what Messiah means. The Anointed One of God must be the one who will not face corruption. So you know Psalm 16, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. So then he just does logical deduction. He says, brothers, that one can't have been David. There had to have been one who did not see corruption. So he's just lining up their expectations of a Messiah, which they all know, with the truth about Jesus. You see how he's doing that? Here's the expectations of the Messiah. Holy One, ruling King, Son of God, will not see corruption. Big space description. Who fits that profile? And he's saying, Jesus fits the profile perfectly, doesn't he, brothers? What choice do you have but to believe? Don't you see how every expectation you have, Psalm 2, let's look at Isaiah 53, that he suffered for sins not his own. Let's, let's look here at Psalm 16. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. He's saying, brothers, obviously it can't have been referring to David because we all know David died and decayed in the grave. Verse 36. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. So the uncorruptible one is the Messiah. Jesus was not corrupted by decay. Brothers, what choice do you have but to see this man as God's chosen Messiah? And his conclusion, verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Incredible. Everything, everything 
from which you could not be freed from the law of Moses is available in this man. So this is part of his conclusion. So he had his introduction, the history of salvation. Then he has his culminating description of Jesus as inevitably the one people must believe as the Messiah since he fulfilled all of God's purposes. And finally, he has an encouragement and a warning at the end. He says, first of all, as an encouragement, Jesus gives the opportunity to be freed from everything that you could not be freed from by the law. Now look down at your Bibles. You see that word freed right there? The word free could also be translated justified. It, it, it has to do with being in right standing, being set free from the curse and the inescapable hopelessness that comes from trying to be reconciled to God through the law. He's saying the law ultimately, because of our sin, only speaks condemnation to us and there is no freedom from its power over us. And there was no way in the law to be set free from the law. But now there is one who can set you free from all of those things, who can justify you and can release you in the ways that the law could never do. You can see Paul in sermon form preaching Romans 3. Now there is a righteousness apart from the law to which the law and the prophets testify the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, brothers, you can be set free from the law. Everything that the law could not free you from can be given to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Incredible news, brothers. Incredible news. You you see what his, his sermon is intending to do. Rejoice! Rejoice in the good news of Jesus Christ, God's chosen Messiah who fulfilled the curse of the law and now offers you righteousness apart from the law, a salvation of freedom and reconciliation with God. Rejoice, brothers! The time has come. The time has come for you to receive the forgiveness that you could not receive through works of the law. It's available to you in Jesus. And we see in this the crucial news that there are no works ultimately that can save us, but there is a person who can save us. Martin Luther said it this way, sin is not canceled by lawful living. Every heart, including mine, needs that sentence every day. Sin is not canceled by lawful living. For no person is able to live up to the law. The law reveals guilt, it fills the conscience with terror, and it drives men to despair. Much less is sin taken away by man-invented endeavors. Other religions, you might say. The fact is, the more a person seeks credit for himself by his own efforts, the deeper he goes into debt. Nothing can take away sin except the grace of God. We obtain the forgiveness by grace alone in opposition to every other means. We obtain the forgiveness of our sins and peace with God. That's what Paul's preaching. What what a phrase. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man and this man alone, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And you can be freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Then he concludes with this warning. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, and be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Even if one tells it to you. Prophet Habakkuk was saying that to those who were facing the judgment of God coming from the enemies of his people. As they come to judge the people, he's saying, you, you, don't, you don't have any hope. You're blinded to what God is doing. And it is to your judgment. He's saying, don't, don't follow in the footsteps of our fathers who refused to believe what God was doing and so were judged. He's saying the same case ultimately is true for anyone who chooses to reject rather than rejoice in the Messiah. He's saying there there will be a judgment, a prophetic level judgment will be denounced on those who reject Jesus Christ. In common parlance, we would say God is not messing around when he brings his son, Jesus Christ, and puts him before humanity. Humanity. 
He is not messing around. This is prophetic level, woe and doom level judgment that will fall on anyone who rejects rather than rejoices in Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground of pluralism. There is no nice Jesus that we respect but we don't follow. There is no middle ground in Paul's sermon. You are either rejoicing or you are rejecting. You are either under prophetic judgment or you are celebrating the freedom that is in Jesus Christ. There is no other way for any human being to hear this message. And every time we hear the gospel, our hearts are either rejoicing or rejecting. Because the gospel is such a message that it does to the heart one thing or the other. We are either hardened or we are softened. We are either rejoicing or we are rejecting. We are either freed or we are condemned. That's the message. That's Paul's message. The Savior died. He died as a curse bearer for those deserving of a curse. But he was raised, and in his resurrection, there is the offer of freedom. And if you accept and believe in him, you are now freed from the curse of the law in him. And yet if you reject him, you are condemned by that same law for rejecting its culmination in Jesus Christ. Second section, the response. The response is initially positive. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. You get a sense of the enthusiasm, the newness of it, the the joy of it, and some of them seemingly see the light. After meeting with the, the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So there's good signs that God's grace is at work in the hearts of some. Paul and Barnabas must have been initially encouraged. But then the next Sabbath, it says almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And then we read verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. These Jews apparently had never learned the lesson of the book of Jonah. They were filled with jealousy, began to contradict Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. That word necessary speaks of divine compulsion, divine command. In other words, God chose out of his graciousness and commitment to his people to demonstrate force to ethnic Jews how this Savior fulfilled all of his promises to them. It was necessary because God wanted this gospel to go first to his ethnic people, the Jews, to tell them, look, all of the promises of your scriptures, all of my promises, I have now culminated and fulfilled in this one perfect Jewish man, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and died for sinners. It was necessary. It was was a fulfilling of God's consistent tender care for this people. That it would go first to them. But sadly, majority, not all, thankfully, there was a remnant. But many, many chose to turn away from this message. And they begin to revile Paul because they are jealous that Gentiles and the Gentiles of this number are attending to the gospel message. They are much more concerned about their place in this movement than they are their salvation from this movement. Paul and Barnabas speak these condemning words. Since you thrust it aside and you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. Then he quotes, you notice there the quote, Isaiah 49, I have made you a light for the Gentiles. Apparently Paul and Barnabas and every Christian so identifies with this promise given to Jesus that they take it as a command. That since Jesus is a light for the Gentiles, his community must consider themselves a light to the world as well. That you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And notice this impressive phrase from Luke. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Believed. 
You, you can't read Acts without understanding the mystery of God's sovereignty. They respond, but ultimately they respond because God had appointed them to respond. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the result is the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the jealousy continues in verse 50. The Jews incited devout women and leading men of the city. They stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drive them out of their district. Paul and Barnabas, in a final statement of judgment, they shake off the dust from their feet, obeying Jesus command. This would have been a sign to say, I don't want to be. Your position is so dangerous and so devastating, so condemnable. I don't even want your dust on my feet. I, I, I don't want to be associated. I don't even want the dust of your town associated with me. So horrific a fate is reserved for those who would reject this incredible offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. In contrast, the disciples are filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Paul preaches a message, and there is a response. The response is categorically different. Rejection, even to the point of persecution and jealousy, leading ultimately to judgment and condemnation and rejoicing, leading to joy in the Holy Spirit, rejoicing in the word of the Lord. Rejection and rejoicing. Sovereignly, the word of the Lord continues to spread, it says. It reaches the entire region. So God's gospel continues to advance. The word of the Messiah bears much fruit and the fruit it bears is joy and rejoicing in the Holy Spirit and negatively condemnation for those who choose to reject the message. And you can imagine 30 years after this event when the early church is reading this account, try to imagine they're reading this account from Luke. Look, we have, we have this marvelous book by Luke and he wrote to us about the, the church that you know is now in Antioch and how it was planted from the original city of Antioch. And, and, and this is its beginning. And, and here's what happened. And we can ask ourselves, how are we doing in response to this message by the Apostle Paul? How are we doing? Are, are we carrying it forward? Are we rejoicing in it or are we rejecting it? And certainly to unbelievers, this same choice is laid out. You can either rejoice in Jesus as the Messiah, as the chosen one who offers to set you free from the burden of your own guilt and your own shame and your own eternal condemnation, or you can reject Jesus and count yourself unworthy in other words, out of the running for receiving eternal life. So if you're here at any age and you're not a Christian, this is the choice that God brings to you. You can either receive Jesus as your Savior who paid for your sins, or you can reject him, and even the dust associated with you is dangerous because you will face the judgment of God for rejecting Jesus. Let's look at these two responses just for our own hearts, rejecting and rejoicing. Rejecting and rejoicing. In this passage, rejecting flows from pride. And it often, I think it often does that. It often flows from pride. These Jews literally reject Christ because in his gospel, there was not a large enough place for them. Let's feel the power of pride in this passage, expressed in jealousy. They reject Jesus. They reject the heritage of their forefathers. They reject God's initiative in salvation. They cut themselves off from the great successor to David because they were jealous that more Gentiles were coming to listen to Paul talk about Jesus than had listened to them. They actually seemed initially interested, certainly a number of them seemed to be interested initially in Jesus. But what shut down their interest was their own demand that their place in this movement be greater, that their spotlight be brighter. Brighter. 
We need to beware the power of pride in our own hearts. Pride is all one. It's all the same. It always is seeking to lead us astray from a celebration of the gospel. Focusing on ourselves is not all that different than what the Jews were doing in Antioch, where jealousy consumed them rather than joy in the Lord Jesus. I was convicted of pride just this weekend. I was talking to my wife, and I just was aware I I am in this conversation. (laughs) So much of my emotion is focused on how this relates to me. And I see myself in the Jews of Antioch. Now, thankfully, I have not rejected Jesus, but I see this pride where so much of what I think about is, how does this relate to me? How does this help me? How does this improve my position? And I think it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous because pride always leads people away from celebrating Jesus. The Reformation is solely Deo Gloria. There is no place for pride in those who believe in Jesus Christ. Pride and gospel rejection always run in the same direction. The pride in your heart, the pride in my heart, ultimately, its ultimate goal, its ultimate intention is to replace Jesus with us at the center. Now, thankfully, I pray in many of us, we don't see the kind of outright rejection that's present here, but we need to take heed because pride always runs in the same direction. It it always has an ultimate goal in mind. And the goal is in full-blown form here. Jealousy and gospel neglect are companions on the road to ruin. The gospel should humble us and exhilarate us, but if we are concerned about our place in a church, in the eyes of others, in our family, in the world, we are training ourselves in that heart that dislikes the exclusive glory of Jesus. We should not be self-righteous to the Jews of Antioch, Pisidia. We should be humbled. We should be warned. We should be sobered. What they did was walk into their synagogue meeting, see a huge crowd and say, man, this people didn't come listen to me. It's not all that different from me. When I see somebody else getting attention or getting a place that I want or getting a promotion that I think I should receive or having a position in the church that I think I should have or getting attention that I think I deserve, not all different from these people and their pride was so consuming of them they allowed it to take over them so much that it led ultimately to them rejecting Jesus himself. Pride and gospel rejection. Feel this. Pride and gospel rejection always run in the same direction. You cannot indulge pride without simultaneously indulging that thing that leads person after person away from Jesus. So think about that this week, tonight, tomorrow, when you're having a conversation with your spouse, like I did this weekend, and I was convicted of pride in my heart. Think about it. That thing always intends, ultimately, the rejection of Jesus. We don't want to be those, even in seed form, who are running on that road. We do want to be those who are rejoicing, like the Gentiles did here. And others, God fears, they began rejoicing and and glorifying the word of the Lord. Rejoicing and glorifying. And then it says in verse 52, they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We want to rejoice in the gospel that has come to us. We don't want to reject it. We want to rejoice it. Rejoice in it. This is to be our theme. Rejoicing in the word of the Lord. I love that phrase. They were glorifying and rejoicing the word of the Lord. They were rejoicing. They were celebrating. They were filled with joy. And they were glorifying, magnifying, pointing to, emphasizing 
the word of the Lord, the word of this great Messiah, Jesus Christ. They were celebrating. They were saying, it is amazing that Jesus died for sinners like us. It is amazing that God raised him from the dead. It is amazing that the man Christ Jesus is the great successor to David. It is amazing, and he should get all the attention, and I love it, they say. This is to be our theme, rejoicing in the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy because we know the one who died for our sins, because Jesus is the light of the world and because God has included us in his sovereign grace. They were looking at that history of the people of Israel and they were saying, God has done it again. He reached me with uplifted arm. He appointed me when I had nothing in me that deserved it. He chose me. He bore with me. He put my sins on Jesus on that tree. He raised me up with Jesus from that tomb and he has promised me freedom from the curse that I deserve because of my sin. God has done it again with me and the only response I can give is to say praise the Lord and receive the glory for this salvation. God how do we do this? How do we rejoice in the word of the Lord like they did? We rejoice in the word of the Lord by preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. I learned that phrase from a man named Jerry Bridges. He is at home with the Lord now, but certainly one of my spiritual heroes. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. What it means is that you don't assume the gospel when you wake up on Wednesday morning or when you're struggling on Wednesday afternoon. Because our tendency, though we wouldn't call it rejecting, might be replacing we replace gospel meditation, like this message gives us, with self-effort and determination and a desire to try harder tomorrow, or self-pity and a determination to blame others for our day. Don't we do that all the time? We replace gospel meditation with self-effort and a desire to try harder tomorrow, or self-pity and an attempt to blame others for what's happening to us today. We, we replace it. So Wednesday afternoon, I'm having a hard time. Here's what I'll do. I can't believe that they, or I'll try harder tomorrow. And even gospel-centered Christians do that all the time. We don't actually think about the gospel. It, it, gospel-centered does not mean saying gospel-centered a lot. It doesn't mean going to a gospel-centered church. It means actual, functionally. Imagine if a person says, you know, I'm kind of food-centered, but I never eat food. I just have it on my home website. And I would never go to a church that wasn't food-centered. But you never eat. I know, it's, but you got to be food-centered, though. I know the signs of not being food-centered, and they're bad. I hate those kind of places. Yes, but you never eat. I, I know, but it's, not, it's, it's, but it's really important to be food-centered. No, actually, functionally, like literally on Wednesday afternoon this week or Thursday morning or Friday morning, will there be a rehearsal of the truths of what Jesus did to save you in your mind? Will that, you know, I was a sinner. I had no hope of heaven. Jesus died for my sins. He suffered for them, and he rose, and because of him, I am set free from the condemnation of the law, and I have hope of heaven. Will, that, will you preach that to yourself every day this week? Will there be a moment where you rehearse that gospel news, this gospel message? He died. He rose. We're saved. We're saved. 
will you, will you rehearse it to yourself every day? That's what it means to functionally be gospel-centered. Who cares what we call ourselves? The point is, on Thursday morning or Friday night or after a conflict, or we don't feel like you're worthy of reading your Bible, or you just got angry at your kid, or you're struggling with your boss at work, or there's a traffic jam and you're going to be late, is the gospel center right there? Preach the gospel to yourselves every day. When we rejoice in the word of the Lord by preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. Second way, we rejoice in the word of the Lord when we eagerly attend the preaching of the gospel. What you are doing this morning. And if you're here and you don't belong to this church, I trust you do that when you're home. Brothers and sisters, we cannot neglect the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our forefathers in the Reformation would have, would have <laughs> been thrilled to hear us opening up and reading the scriptures in our own language this morning, something that their contemporaries could never do. And we must not take that for granted either. We must attend with eagerness, with boldness, with, with desire and joy the preaching of the gospel. We preach it to ourselves and we let it fall on our ears because we need it in our souls It means we prepare for it on Saturday night. It means we wake up anticipating it on Sunday morning. Uh, trust me, I, I say this as I preach every week, thankfully, to a humble and marvelous church. But it is, it is as much the role of a congregation to prepare for the preaching as it is the preacher's role to prepare for the preaching. It, it, it's quite possible for a, a preacher to be unprepared and a congregation prepared or for the reverse to be the case. Preacher prepared, congregation unprepared. C come ready for the preaching of the gospel. Come with a, a heart open, with a heart softened, with a heart ready to receive. Prioritize it. Don't assume that it's, it's better to neglect the preaching of the gospel than to endorse it and to come and to attend and to hear it. Prioritize it. Fathers, prioritize this in your family planning. Mothers, prioritize this when you think about talking to your children about the best day of the week. I, I don't bring this thankfully as a, as a correction, but as an encouragement, as a celebration of what you're currently doing, what you do every week, but I don't want this to be lost in our church. We want to rejoice and we want to be like these Gentiles where week after week, Sunday after Sunday, we're coming in rejoicing. What, what a moment that was. They came in almost the whole city and the whole city's there and they hear the word again. They rejoice in it. The light of the world has come to us, they say, and I want to be like them. I want to rejoice in the word of the Lord. The gospel of God's sovereign grace has come to us. It is our joy and our hope. The one crucified on a cross under God's curse was cursed for us and rose victorious to bring salvation to our lost souls. Martin Luther, who was a sinner and not a perfect man, but a believer in Jesus said this, who can understand the riches of the glory of his grace? Here, this rich and divine bridegroom, Christ, marries this poor, wicked harlot, redeems her from all evil, and adorns her with all his goodness. Her sins cannot now destroy her, since they are laid upon Christ and swallowed up by him. And she has that righteousness in Christ, her husband, of which she may boast as her own and which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I have sinned, yet my Christ in whom I believe has not sinned and all his is mine and all mine is his. You invite the worship team to join me. I want to sing a song celebrating one of the solas of the Reformation, Christ alone. Let's pray as they make their way up. Lord, we, we thank you for the heritage of the gospel and the gift of the gospel that you've given to us. We thank you for it, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that this 
morning and this week and tonight and in the hard moments every day this week that we would be a gospel people, that we would be a Christ-centered people, that you would draw us close to you in the good news of the gospel and that we would rehearse this same message in our own hearts this week. Lord, I pray you would give us grace to reject morality and self-pity and to choose gospel meditation instead. Fill us with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with joy and with the Holy Spirit as we fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray. And now, Lord, receive our song. Receive our song, we pray. In your name.